Good afternoon. This is Durham Wong Rieger, President and CEO of the Canadian Organization for Rare Disorders. And we're so very, very pleased to be able to have you join us to here today. We're going to get started in a very, very short uh, couple minutes, but um, we'll wait and give a few people a bit more chance to come on. But really, we want to say how pleased we are that we've had such a good response to this um, beginning of our webinar series especially um, as we recognize that this is the beginning of a holiday weekend, but we do hope that this is something that you will not only find worthwhile, but you will join us as we uh, actively pursue this discussion. So I'll give it a, another half a minute or so, and then I'll go into the beginnings. The way we've got the, it set up is that I'll do a presentation, we'll have some discussions with a panel, and then we're gonna, we'll have it open for questions the entire time. I'm sure that everybody by now has uh, become familiar with how you use the, um, the web uh, functions, but just in case, you will see that there is a, a questions box so that you may in fact uh, type questions into that box and let us know that uh, any questions you want to have addressed. I like uh, what uh, Bill Dempster, who's always hosted most of our sessions, says to me, maybe I can get somebody who's online just to type a question into the question box of any, your choice, just so we know that that question box is working. Can I get somebody who just volunteer to type anything into the question box? The question function is working. Uh, we're good to go. I don't see any questions. You see a question? Yeah, it's it's Bill, and thanks. I see the questions. I'll try to build it out so that you have the capacity to, or I'll text or email you the questions uh, as they come in. But I'll I'll try to make sure that everyone can see them who are panelists, and and keep the questions coming. Sorry about that. Okay. Thank you. You sound like the voice from the Phantom of the Opera guy. Thank you very much for that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very much. We are going to get started because we do want to be able to take full advantage of the time. We have, in fact, called this the Countdown to Canada's Rare Disease. Uh, well, I'm shortening it to say Canada's Rare Drug Strategy. We are planning to host this as a discussion series in this fall, and I'll talk to you a little bit about more about where we're going to go. But this is the first of our uh, webinar series leading into a national meeting that will be taking place right at the beginning of December. So why are we doing this and what is the uh, impetus for this? I think as many of you will know, oh sorry, this is our launch event and we will have with us today a round table. Um, I'm honored to President and CEO of the Canadian Organization for Rare Disorders. I'm really delighted with the um, representation we have on this panel. Rebecca Yu, who is Vice President, I think she's with Market and um, Access with Tech Data Canada. Sandra Anderson, who has been a, a great colleague with CORE for many years and has been helping us also with our other series on the Patient Partners Leadership Training, Vice President of NMR Strategies. Nicola Warsworth, who's had many um, um, the roles, but um, is with us today as a director for Jesse's Journal Journey on behalf of Muscular Dystrophy, and Naya Awada, who also has a number of other roles, but um, is going to be speaking with us in her capacity as someone who's been doing research in the area of orphan drug policies, a PhD candidate at uh, Carleton University. Uh, and just very, very briefly, because um, I'll go into the rationale for this, just to let you know that this is the first of a series of uh, of uh, webinars that we will be doing leading up to a conference that we will host at the beginning of December to bring these issues together. So this is the first one, and we really are talking about, is it time? Does Canada still need an orphan drug policy? Our second webinar, which will take place in two weeks time, is gonna be looking at how well does Canada do and what should it be doing in terms of access to drugs for preventive and risk reduction therapies. Um, we will be using some examples from the uh, blood disorders community. Our third webinar is going to talk about the individualized needs for rare therapies, and some of that will absolutely be looking at the new uh, cellular gene therapies, but also looking at the whole host of therapies. What are the ways in which we want to make sure that we're going to be able to address individualized needs? Um, webinar four is going to be looking at calling for a streamlined process uh, with the regulatory HTA and pricing agencies. As we know, we've had some in, uh, amazing challenges going forward in these areas, but we've also had amazing developments. 
And the fourth one is looking at um, innovative funding. What are the ways in which we are going to be able to fund drugs for rare diseases? Do we need to new, have some different funding models that are going to be meeting the needs of different drugs, uh, the innovative drugs as they're coming mm -hmm. forth? So that's kind of what the overview is. You may sign up, but I think we have on our, um, we already have the opportunity for you to sign up for any one of these or for all of these on our website. And hopefully, you know, people will be able to take part. Um, we won't do a Q and A right now, but I'm going to um, go into our my actual presentation for this session, and then we'll open it up for a panel discussion. So I'm going to open it up with, you know, the question is, does Canada still need an orphan drug policy? And um, we know that uh, we are somewhat different space than other countries, and we'll hear a whole lot more about that. But is this the time for us to reconsider an orphan drug policy? This is CORD for hopefully all of you are familiar with, but if not, we to know that CORD is a network. We have got about 102 patient groups, uh, probably a bit more by our last count really have one simple mission and that is to improve the lives of all those that are affected by their diseases. We work a lot on the um, policy end and uh, about five years ago launched Canada's rare disease strategy which I will also talk about as we're moving forward we talk about a drug strategy. So those are two components that we really want to be able to highlight. So why now? Why are we launching this series and why was it so urgent? For us to start it now in the midst of a pandemic, in the midst of all the other issues that we're trying to deal with, well, we do believe that um, a lot of things have come together to make this the right time for us to push forward, to call for a drug strategy, but to also look a little bit um, backwards to say, do we also still need some form of orphan drug, drug regulations um, framework policy? And where are we now with regard to the uh, this, the needs that are not being addressed uh, based on our lack of a policy. What we do know is that um, very shortly, in a week or so, the Patent Medicine Surprise Review Board is going to come up with their new set of guidelines, and we're hoping that, in fact, they will continue to address what we've been pushing for, and that is the assurance that um, rare disease drugs are going to be treated in a way that is going to continue to foster their um, their submissions into Canada, their ability to be able to be approved in Canada. We were very pleased to see in the last round of the guidelines some movements toward the concerns that we raised. We're hoping in the next and final round that we will see the concerns that have been raised by the rare diseases community, by the industry, by anybody who's dealing with specialty drugs, that they will in fact be adequately addressed in those uh, revised guidelines to assure that we're going to get those drugs coming to Canada and not feeling repressed by um, extraordinary uh, drug uh, pricing policies. Where we are really coming from is um, those of you who paid attention to the uh, speech from the throne, the governor general, who uh, included in the, um, the recommendations for uh, policies going forward, a commitment again to an overall rare disease strategy. We were pleased that it said a rare disease strategy, not just for drugs, but that recognition we believe is that optimal drug access requires that we have a system around us, a rare disease strategy that is going to address diagnosis clinical care, and all the other kinds of supportive programs, including research and including that the patient community there, but recognizing we need, a, um, we need a framework, we need an infrastructure if we're going to do a good job in terms of making drugs available in a way that's going to be most appropriate and it's going to be uh, most cost effective. Um, those of you will know is that in February 2019, before uh, the last government rose, the Canadian government committed $1 billion to the creation of a national uh, rare disease drug strategy to be in place by 2022. And we were very pleased with the idea that it was a, a, a drug strategy, not just a drug program, not just drug funding, but we really were talking about how do we make sure that we've got a strategic approach to this? And the recognition is that the funding is not going to be going to just paying for drugs, but it really has to contribute to developing that framework and that program. Um, you will know that in 2019, we, you know, um, uh, Dr. Hoskins' report on pharma care for all prescription for pharma care identified the need for a distinct pathway for the consideration of expensive drugs for rare diseases and proposed within there a national expert panel to work with the patients and their clinicians to determine 
which rare disease drugs should be funded for which patients. We are very pleased with the idea that there's a separate panel that recognizes that these small patient populations, these complex um, specialty drugs needed to have a different approach than just being placed into a formulary and just being uh, considered you know, in the same way of, of dispensing as other drugs. And that the patients and the clinicians would be an intimate part of those um, decisions around which drugs and how they would be uh, made available. 2018, November, um, I think we were quite excited that after many years of uh, being around in deliberation, the uh, Provincial Territorial Expensive Drugs for Rare Diseases Working Group announced that there would be the development of a supplemental process that would be addressing managed access to complex specialty drugs, including rare disease drugs. Some of you are familiar with the United Kingdom's uh, NICE and their program for highly specialized therapies. We'll recognize that this is some of that same language, a separate pathway parallel to the regular pathway, but also recognizing the special needs, but most importantly, recognizing the fact that many of these drugs may come to market with limited um, you know, pre-approval data, we'll have had small clinical trials, we'll have had uh, sometimes only phase two data, we'll maybe working with a very highly specialized subpopulation. But the fact is that because these are oftentimes the first therapy for severe progressive diseases that have no other therapies, the goal is to get them to patients as soon as possible. And sometimes that means bringing them in, you know, with a data set that will require further collection of information data on a post-market monitoring basis. So this is very exciting to us. We do it now. We have many managed access programs that have been set up in cancers and other diseases, especially in rare diseases. It's just that it's never been systematically done. There's no real guidelines for it. There's no real process by which we identify which drug should be uh, taken to this process and how that process would actually be designed. So this is a huge step forward. And uh, finally, we know that in uh, 2018, when Health Canada was modernizing the whole drug regulatory process, even though they did not actually have a separate set of regulations for orphan drugs, they did produce a designated regulatory approach to drugs for rare diseases. And I'll give you that a bit more. I'm sure many of you will be familiar with it. It's a huge, um, it's a huge indication that we will be able to appropriately uh, review uh, the clinical trials as you know in, in the beginning, um, pre-submission to our packages, as well as being able to provide an expedited process by which we can bring these drugs that are again for these patients with high needs to market. So why do we need it? I won't uh, certainly need to belabor this for most of this audience here. Uh, you know, we are you know, uh, even though we say rare diseases are rare, we recognize that collectively they actually affect, you know, millions of Canadians. And, uh, you know, one in 12 we estimate, could be one in eight, could be, you know, a bit more or less than that. It's, um, the numbers are obviously not exact. The challenges are that, um, you know, we have provincial access to care, provincial drug programs. So it's not that straightforward in terms of having national programs which are essential for rare diseases. This is just a little graphic that I like to play with to show that, you know, relative to other chronic diseases for which we actually have strategies and we have strategies that work very well in terms of being able to um, do prevention, early diagnosis, uh, comprehensive integrated care, access to innovative therapies, we do not have the same for rare diseases, even though this population is significant and, um, as we say, larger than most of the other chronic diseases when we consider them in an aggregate, 7,000 rare diseases. So here's the challenge we're up against all the time, and we oftentimes default to talking about drug therapies when we're talking about uh, rare diseases because access to a therapy is oftentimes the starting point for many other things happening, including awareness and diagnosis. What we do know, and this one says 8% of the global population is affected by rare diseases, fewer than 5% of these um, diseases actually have a treatment. So this is the hard part and why we are still considering, do we need an orphan drug policy? Fewer than 10% of patients who have a rare disease, where there is a drug that's available, actually get access to that therapy. This is a US number, but quite frankly, that number parallels what is happening, you know, certainly in Canada, in Europe, 
And this is the developed world. So even when there is a therapy, we're not getting access to the people. And worldwide, of course, the number is abysmal, less fewer than 1% of patients who could have access to a therapy, where there's one exists, actually do have access to that therapy. So, you know, not only do we need more orphan drugs, we really do need to think about how do we make them available to people and how do we make them available to people throughout the world, throughout different socioeconomic strata, to make sure that we're not only doing the best in terms of patients, but at the end of the day, if we're talking about getting the most out of a therapy, certainly getting the most efficiencies and cost effectiveness, we really need to get this 1% number way, way higher, this 10% number way, way higher, but obviously this less than 5% higher as well. So very briefly, I think many of you will know is that the Orphan Drug Act is the beginning of all new therapies, uh, treatment for therapies, started by Abby Myers, a mother who had two sons with Tourette syndrome, Henry Laxman, a congressman who was brought into the campaign, um, you know, but had already been pushing in Congress to have a bill that would provide special incentives to drugs for rare diseases for small patient populations. And then... Um, you know, uh, you know, one of or Jack Klugman, who is a you know a movie star. Though I find the more audiences I speak to who are young, I do have people who say who. Uh, anyway, he's a very famous actor who was instrumental in terms of being able to help push uh, a rare the rare orphan drug act through Congress in the U.S. in 1983. Was the starting point for recognizing the challenges of companies doing research for small patient populations which were going to be difficult in terms of developing drugs to the point where they were not only going to be able to be demonstrated to be effective, but were also going to be cost effective. So this is kind of where we are. Um, the rest of the world, 1983, the US says, okay, we're going to make um, some special incentives for drugs to be available for rare diseases. And I think it's important to note that, you know, as we say, in the decade prior to the 1983 Rare Disease Act, there were only 10 new drugs for rare diseases. That whole decade since that time, things have changed significantly. 1993, uh, Japan developed, uh, introduced legislation for drugs for, for intractable diseases, their definition in terms of treat drugs, small populations that were not getting treatments. And Japan has actually contributed significantly to the development and discovery of drugs for rare diseases. 1999, 2000, the European Union says we need to attract the research and development monies to Europe. We recognize there is, in fact, a huge need for these drugs, but we also recognize the investment in these drugs were going elsewhere, not coming to Europe. And so we need to create the same kind of an environment uh, that the U.S. and other countries are creating to make sure that research and development is taking place in Europe, that the investment is going to be made in Europe and that the companies will be able to remain in Europe. So this was, you know, again, providing us incentives, everything from the protocol assistance, market exclusivity, fee waivers, fast track approvals. 2000, Taiwan then, a um, very small country, very small patient population, also then introduced a, a tremendous orphan drug act, but also a tremendous rare disease policy. And what we have seen is that orphan drug acts and rare disease policies and rare disease drug access go hand in hand, where you've got an incentive upfront to invest in the research and development of those drugs, where companies are investing and in actually setting up operations in these countries. It creates then an environment that says, okay, we all also need to make sure that these drugs are available to people. 2003, South Korea then began to support local drug development. And I have been over in Korea where we've actually had the opportunity to visit some of these companies and see the work that they're doing in terms of investing in the uh, research for, for rare disease drugs. And I think Sandra will talk to us a little bit later about these companies and coming to North America, coming to Canada. Uh, a big step that was made in 2007 is that USA and the EU says we have slightly different um, definitions, but we can harmonize our orphan drug destination. So a company, when it wants to make a destination, can go to the US and the EU with one package, get the destination with one application. That was our goal as well in having an orphan drug policy in Canada is that we would hopefully be part of that USA and EU harmonization. So you could come to Canada at the same time and actually then begin to look at development in Canada, clinical trials in Canada, and bringing them to, to market um, early on. So this is just a little graphic that just shows you what we have. I put the Philippines in there because the Philippines itself came up with its own Orphan Drug Act in 2016. 
in 2018, uh, when Health Canada, we did put out a pathway, it was sort of a nod towards the fact that we were going to have, we do have something that we can call um, attractive uh, policies for rare diseases submissions, but um, the question is, are we there? Is that sufficient? Do we need more than that? And why might we? Uh, we almost had an orphan drug act, uh, orphan drug policy uh, back in 2014. I won't belabor it except to say that, you know, court did tremendous work at that time, advocacy work, multi-stakeholder work, worked hard with Health Canada, and they actually produced an orphan drug framework. I mean, it seems like so long ago now, 2014, consultations took place on it. We were delighted with it, not only because it would bring us in line with other countries, it was actually state of the art. It was actually far um, reaching, far looking. It was a visionary submission because it really looked at the fact that we're now talking about drugs with a life cycle approach. So not just developing drugs and being able to provide support and incentives for them to be developed, but actually being able to think about how are they going to be made available to patients? What do we need to consider? Recognizing that in many cases, we want to bring these drugs to the patients as quickly as possible. So we are going to be looking at, you know, uh, expedited approval processes. We are going to be looking at setting up processes for data collection after they're um, already approved so that we can be assured that we can get them out early, but we can monitor their safety and their effectiveness on a go forward basis. And nobody actually else in the world has actually got that as part of their orphan drug policies. Promotion of patient registries to make that happen. And then, as we said, the enhancements on post-market monitoring, which are hugely important in terms of providing assurance to certainly the companies, but also to the payers and certainly to the patients that these drugs, even though they're coming in with early evidence, are going to be safe. I mean, we're having those same parallel conversations with COVID right now, right? The vaccines for COVID, how quickly can they come? What is it that would make you feel okay about the fact that we're rushing them through an approval process, but what do we need to do to make sure that we're going to be able to provide the kind of post-market monitoring to ensure that they're safe? The big difference is that you're talking about these going to millions of people as opposed to going to very select small patient populations. But the principle is the same. Unfortunately, it disappeared. That whole, you know, after consultations, being on the website for several years and being in front of, almost in front of the parliament for a number of years, one day the whole thing disappeared. And we have never yet had a satisfactory explanation as to why that whole framework just kind of went poof and we didn't see it again. We have not seen it again. So why do we need it? Well, I will just very quickly say that, you know, in Canada, we have tremendous capacities for doing research and development. This is a very quick uh, piece around a, a drug that was discovered by uh, you know, Dr. Philip Prime in the Philip Prime University of Montreal. It's for a very severe disease where um, children are born almost with no bones because they don't have the capacity to build those bones. They're missing the essential elements for it. It was a drug that was di discovered in Montreal. A little company, Anovia, was set up in Montreal. Uh, we could not give it any orphan designation, so it went to Europe and the U.S. to get the orphan designation. At that point, the headquarters also shifted to Boston. And... Um, it was run out of Boston, California for a number of years, even though the first clinical trial site was still in Winnipeg because of the early involvement in it, because the Mennonite community, which have an inordinate number of people, uh, families that are affected by this condition. And in fact, the first baby that was actually treated was treated um, in the clinical trial in Winnipeg, though the baby was blown in from Ireland. Um, and this is, you can see the child at about six years old going from when we first knew her to being so fragile that she could be, couldn't be handled, had had 60 broken bones by the time she was about six months old to being a child who for all intents and purposes is living a very, very normal life, though on treatments for her entire life. But this was a drug that started here. We kind of lost it. And then um, afterwards it was, you know, picked up by a succeeding commercial companies and coming back to Canada but all we're doing now is paying for the drug. None of those investments are actually remaining in Canada. This is just another quick example of a drug discovered in Canada. And again, we seem to be on the leading edge of many things. This was, I mean, I don't know how many people here know that the first gene therapy in the entire world is actually just, uh, that was actually approved in the entire world was actually discovered in Canada. A group of researchers out um, at UBC I actually was on a video webinar presentation and one of the people in the audience woke up and said, yes, I was on that research team. I was thrilled. I mean, 
it's for, again, a very severe condition, very high triglycerides, a genetic condition. Uh, the only treatment for this disease is for patients to be on an extraordinary low-fat diet, which is almost impossible to maintain. But even on a diet, the problem is that these triglycerides will accumulate in uh, not only in the organs, but mostly if they accumulate in the pancreas, lead to very painful attack of pancreatitis, which if anybody's ever had, somebody explained it as being 10 times worse than childbirth. So this is, and they can be spontaneous, they're unpredictable. First gene therapy was discovered, as we say, in Canada, private company uh, funded it. Um, all the clinical trials, most of the clinical trials were actually done in Quebec, um, but the private company went bankrupt. We did not have the ability to have the investment in it and attract the, um, the investors in the way that the US and other countries might have. The company was then acquired then by a company in Boston, but because this was a very small biotech, they also couldn't quite bring it to market. They sold the licensing rights to a pharmaceutical company in um, Italy. It was in fact uh, approved in Europe uh, in, by the EMA with a very stringent post-marketing surveillance, also with a very high upfront price tag of $1.2 million, which in those days was, um, well, in today's days, it's still a lot, but in those days was very much uh, a huge issue. And um, in fact, uh, they didn't have the marketing and, and clinical uh, strength to be able to really get the drug out. And um, in 2017, it was withdrawn. It worked. It's an amazing therapy. It works really well. And in fact, um, I know patients who have been uh, who have had it or are still disease free. I met the patient in Berlin uh, when I was in uh, Europe. The one, um, a German postman who got the last uh, vial of it for free because they were just trying to get rid of the uh, the stock and his clinician got it. He is still some six or seven years later living without symptoms and without any other treatment. Um, the problem, of course, is that there is no other treatment for it. There's been a, a number of tries to it. There was a therapy that was going to be available, not a gene therapy. The FDA said, no, we can't approve it. It had two serious side effects in terms of very, very low platelet counts. The EMA says, yes, we can conditionally, but to this date, it really is not being funded. And uh, NICE was one of the ones that said, yes, it seems to have some benefit, but from a cost effectiveness point of view, it doesn't work. So I just bring it back to say, why do we might need an orphan drug policy in Canada? We're, we have a chance maybe to do a bit of a rescue. So this is our second chance, I call it. You know, should we be thinking about it? Um, and the National Research Council has now kind of come back with a program, which they call disruptive technology, where they're trying to build a vector lab where they can actually develop the vectors, where these um, uh, genes can actually be inserted and that they could use this. And the first drug they want to go for is a Glyveria in its um, genetic form to be able to make it available. And they're hoping that in fact, they can bring this drug back out and make it very cost effective, but using it then to start off this uh, vector lab in, in Canada. So we think it's a, an amazing opportunity. And again, what would it take? What are the kinds of investments? So just to finish off very quickly, as we know um, in Canada, it's very challenging for patients to get access to the orphan drugs. And I think part of it's related to the fact that we do not have a specific policy here. 770 products have been approved since the 1983 Orphan Drug Act. And that's pretty amazing. In Europe, about 169 through their act. In Canada, we've only approved about half of those drugs. We only uh, have proved about half of the drugs are available in Canada. Health Canada says it might be a bit higher than that, but at any rate, what we know is that there's significant number of drugs for rare diseases that we don't get access to. And this just shows the list of the drugs that are approved and in the US that have been, you know, uh, through the Orphan Drug Act. And as you can see, the greens are the yeses, the reds are the noes. They have not come to Canada. And in many cases, these are very severe conditions. These are drugs that would be the first drug for a specific condition, but the incentives to come to Canada are just not there. And the incentives to host the clinical trials in Canada, which would open up a pathway for those drugs to be approved in Canada, just aren't there. And this is something that for Canadian patients, of course, makes it a huge difficulty. This shows again what we've got. These are the drugs that have been approved by the US, you know, in the period of five years here. This are the same in that same five years. And this is our problem, is that comparatively, we're just not getting those drugs in Canada. I don't think it's because Health Canada doesn't do its job in terms of approving it. They just aren't coming. You can't approve drugs that don't show up. And this then is kind of where we see the comparisons, right? So 
over the years, it's gotten worse. We've now got a few drugs that were not approved, but now we've got, you know, many, many more drugs that are not approved relative to, to being approved. And again, not, it's not that they're not approved by Health Canada, it's that they have not come to Health Canada necessarily for approval. I will finish this very quickly. It's not to, to belabor it. Health Canada has, in fact, put up a roadmap. They have, despite the fact we don't have an orphan drug policy, have been able to provide you know, some of the same kinds of incentives. Uh, they recognize a definition of rare diseases as the US, as the uh, European one. They say that if, and they are able to provide special provisions for clinical trials for small patient populations, including, you know, the number of patients that would be recognized, including, you know, single arm trials. They have been able to provide rapid market authorizations under an expedited process. They do provide support for post-market. So a lot of the components are here. It's just that it isn't in fact recognized and there's very little incentives to getting the companies to come into Canada. Um, and I think that's our challenge. Um, I won't belabor this, but those of you who do know is that we do have many aspects of that process that are available once the companies do come. But again, in some cases, we talk to many companies, and maybe Sandra can speak to that as well, who don't even know we have this pathway. Um, and this is some of the other things that we do. We do, and I won't belabor it um, in terms of, again, this is that manage access process. So on the far end, once we've got the drugs here, this is in place yet. And this, frustratingly slow since 2018 in terms of how little work has been done, you know, in 2020, two years later, to actually have a process. Um, I think they put out one paper that says, here's what we heard in our consultation. So we are very frustrated by the fact that the um, uh, EDRD recommended a process, and they've got two groups that are working on it, but we've seen almost nothing in terms of what they're actually doing, and we certainly have seen been involved in no consultations, which is why we're out there on the road. We are, you know, I think we're tired of waiting for others to actually do this, uh, you know, so we get something announced, but then nothing really happens. Um, and this is the components of that manage access process that so I won't belabor, um, but it would include all the things we want, early screening, simultaneous submissions to Health Canada and CADA, uh, an enhancer, you know, technology assessment review. Right now, it goes through the rare disease drugs, go through the same process as other drugs, and hopefully sort of faster PCA negotiations and a, a, um, a structured process for post-world a real world post-market evidence collection um, that would allow us to get these drugs in in a way that feels safe, cost-effective to everybody. This would be much more timely, transparent decision makings, allow us to make sure that we've got the clinicians involved in order to be able to determine what these drugs are like, could be part of a pharma care process, uh, regardless of how that pharma care rolls out. So we know it's a proven strategy, we know it actually works, uh, we've had, you know, many pilot studies on it. We have active drugs that are currently using a managed access process. And this is my last set of slides. It's still recognized, though, that one of the big barriers in all this, I say we're expecting the new guidelines to come in in October, but we have certainly been challenged by the guidelines that were put out, you know, beginning in uh, 2019 that really suggested that we would be putting some strict caps in terms of reimbursed prices that would drive us from where we are now and somewhat favorable status and even then of course not getting the access that we want down to maybe a median status but in reality once we've actually looked at everything they're actually applying we drive us to a capped price reimbursed price somewhere down here which would almost um, remove any incentives for drugs coming in certain drugs for rare diseases. So we're still battling this in terms of how do we get pricing um, of uh, guidelines that are going to be still able to uh, be attractive to companies coming in. I won't belabor this um, because we will have an opportunity to talk about this a bit more, but it does introduce more uncertainty, more bureaucracy in our review processes. But I will end with this, where do we go from here? We are starting the consultations on a rare disease strategy. We are going to hopefully be able to roll this out over these few weeks and over to the next month. So we're going to roll out the supplemental process with the um, EDRD program. We want to be able to start um, consultations next year. We're hoping to be in the provinces and be able to really work with the provinces in terms of what they need to see in terms of a drug strategy in order to have it uh, have buy into it. And we're hoping that by the end of next year, we will in fact have 
a proposal for a, a rare disease drug strategy that would actually be almost ready for implementation, as we say, by the time we get to 2022. So I will end it on that. And if I can figure out how to get out of here, we will turn it back over to the panel. Oh, this is good. Can it, so we're all here. Um, and I'm sorry to have taken as long as I did. I had not meant to go over that long on it, but I wanted to give us a solid introduction. I did introduce the panel very briefly before, um, but I'm going to bring them into the discussion now. And hopefully everybody is primed and ready. Um, because really what I want to ask each one of you from your own perspective, you know, do we need an orphan drug policy? Where are we with regard to in your you know, specific uh, stakeholder perspective, where are we in Canada with regard to rare disease drugs? Do we provide the right kinds of incentives and support? Do we need to do more? Would a specific orphan drug policy help us in terms of being able to advance what we feel is important? Rebecca, I'm gonna turn to you first to speak um, from an industry perspective, but I think also from somebody who's intimately involved in policy and governance uh, over the years. Right. Thank you, Derhan, and uh, certainly thank you to yourself and to Court, one, for the invitation, but secondly, for actually bringing attention to this very important uh, topic. And uh, you have been very persistent and um, like the attitude of never giving up. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to be able to share our perspective. Um, so I'm putting my hat on, but not just the Takeda hat, but also my perspective from working in, in different space of what this means. Um, absolutely, I think uh, is extremely positive to see that um, organ diseases was mentioned in the throne speech. I think uh, we for sure, for not just as an industry, but for the patients and for those, and, and also for the folks in the, uh, in the audience. I'm also a healthcare professional too as well. I'm a pharmacist and trying to get my practicing license back right now. Um, but it's, it's important that we actually think and put on our multiple hats outside of just our silos. And I think this is, in my opinion, what's sort of happening in terms of why you were saying it's been taken almost 10 years and there's been no movement. I think everyone's working in silos and not actually working in a concerted effort. Um, it is positive to see, as I said, mentioned in the throne speech, um, there has been other strategies that have been successful. Um, UK, for example, have done uh, Alzheimer's uh, strategy and dementia strategy, and, and it's in partnership together with multiple stakeholders, and they're moving forward to a common goal. And I think that's what we need to do. And as I think about, um, you know, I've taken some notes of what a strategy should encompass, there are three things. One you mentioned earlier, increased screening and diagnosis, especially in this population. We have a strength of AI in Ontario, Alberta, Quebec specifically. We need to leverage that and how are we gonna move that forward? Secondly, something that's very dear to my heart is how do we attract R&D investment into Canada, specifically for rare diseases? And that needs to be part of that strategy as well. And when I think about um, the many times that I've brought in uh, global stakeholders to come in either in my current role or my previous role to see what's great here in Canada, the one thing that, that attracted them was, you know, and I, I apologize to the rest of Canada, but I know Ontario the most, is seeing what's happening in University Avenue, right? When they see the density of what's there with U of T, the hospitals, hospital for sick kids specifically for rare diseases, um, it's amazing stuff. And that could only happen if the government actually sees it as something that they see as an investment. And I don't mean just putting money in, providing the support to academia, to startups, to entrepreneurs, to basic science researchers focusing on rare diseases. And what can we do to actually have them become the strengths and leaders of the world? And when you do that, and when folks come in and you bring in different folks to see what's happening here, that's when they start thinking, okay, we need to, investors can start thinking, you know what, we need to start investing in here. Pharma companies can consider doing clinical trials. In, you know, investors who are very, um, usually in, in Canada, more nervous about investing, we're going to, we can get Boston investors, San Francisco VCs coming in. And also the one thing we didn't talk about, talent, right? Um, that's a huge gap for Canada is entrepreneurs to lead some of these startup companies and to be able to drive it to the next stage. And so, you know, it's great that you provided a couple of examples, Sirhan, and, and, you know, and I mentioned as we prep for this, there was one company that, that um, really stood out in my mind, too, called Everbio. I worked with them in my previous role. And it was a technology uh, focused on for fabulous disease and was founded by uh, UHN. 
they didn't have the support that they needed in Canada and they moved to Boston. So their head office in Boston and, and that's, that's done. And so part of that is actually building that ecosystem so that you can see people and start bringing in that positive collisions and, and, and just starting to get the wheel going. The third piece is uh, access, which is part of my full-time job, which is market access and external affairs, um, increasing the speed and quality of access, especially in this space. You talk about diagnosis, uh, which takes five to seven years to diagnose. You've already eaten up seven years there. There's a huge amount of hurdles because it's so difficult to collect data. If you collect the data that um, you know regulatory bodies need, HGA bodies need, so what they need to make the bar, there needs to be a different way of looking at things. Frameworks needs to be set up, either regulatory, HTA, whatever that looks like, that we need to work together to get there. So that's a, three things I can think of, which I think needs to be part of that strategy. And anything the federal government um, does, be it, um, I know you mentioned PR and PRB, but whatever it is that the federal government does, and also the provincial government does, whatever they do in the strategy and whatever um, uh, processes that they, they introduce, needs to actually take into account these three, three things, because if it contradicts these three things, then they're not working towards a common goal, which is to establish the rare disease strategy. And what I, I want to end with is, um, you know, I think the past year has been a very interesting year for everybody um, with COVID. And it's very clear to everybody that when you want to work together to a common goal, be it a public, private, stakeholders, patients, caregivers, healthcare professionals, and you can work towards a common goal with urgency and with trust. And so my question, I guess, to the audience and, and any folks I, I would talk to in the government is, if you can do that in a pandemic for COVID, this is, in my opinion, uh, is no less important, uh, maybe less slightly urgent, but it's still very important. Why can't you do the same thing? And so, you know, you know that's, that's what I'm gonna end with in terms of my portion of it. Thanks, Durhan. Thank you so much, Rebecca. You covered off a huge amount and it brings us always back to, you know, we often are thinking about a rare disease drug strategy is how do we just get to access, but that isn't enough and it shouldn't be no, enough. It's not okay, enough. Then I'm going to punt to you because uh, you sit in a very unique spot. You do patient and patient support programs here and you work with companies coming into Canada, but you've also been an ambassador in terms of trying to bring companies into Canada, market Canada. So I'm going to ask you to be brief though, because I want to make sure we get to everybody. Where do you see it and how would you pick up on, on what yeah, I've introduced, but also what Rebecca said? So thank you again, Durhain, for including me today. And thanks, Rebecca, for your summary. Um, my perspective is as um, leader in Inamar, working with companies, trying to attract them to Canada, trying to understand how we can walk them through the process. We do speak to companies quite early on before they even decide to come to Canada. Um, and they're concerned, right? They ask a lot of key questions when they're thinking about launching and they compare Canada to other countries to, to talk about the stability of the country. And they always ask, especially if they're obviously in rare disease, does Canada have a rare disease strategy or policy or framework or pathway to allow me to launch my drug in Canada? Um, these are very important questions as they, you know, they don't, when they are launching their drug, they want to reduce risk. They want to have certainty. They want to have partnerships and support. So a lot of our discussions are in the pre-development side is as they're investing on clinical, how supportive would it be to launch in Canada? What is the drug, you know, re approval process, reimbursement framework? pricing will i make up an, a return on investment within year one within year two um, they're looking at that stuff and when so when i come and say we don't have a rare disease strategy or we have pmprb which introduces a level of uncertainty that creates risk for them and we've had some examples in the last year where we've had some manufacturers um, delay delay their launch because they are afraid of the uncertainty whether it's the pricing or the lack of a drug you know, strategy or formal pathway. Um, we've had delays of two to three years. We've had some companies, Canada, originally a tier one launch country, move into a tier two. And so we find some of these companies trying to actually sell. Why Canada? I'm selling Canada. Canada is a great place. We have some, obviously, a great country. But if we don't have a pathway, a predictive uh, framework, then companies feel like Canada is a risky place. And why would I set up shop, invest in resources, infrastructure, capital, all the fees that come with registering with Health Canada, CADIS, NS. I mean, there's a lot of fees and investment. They need to understand, they need to have less risk. And so 
Um, it creates a lot of concern. Uh, you know, we have manufacturers delaying or not coming or, you know, talking about Canada in a later framework. So I do think having a formal rare disease pathway would mean that Canada would have a solid environment. It would have allow us to be more favorable to manufacturers as they come in. And it needs to happen. We need to have the support from others, the government, the feds. Um, if we don't have that certainty, companies won't come. And it's a shame. And, and it's something, this is real world experience that I'm speaking about, our, my team and all. Um, we have a lot of examples. So I, I really am passionate about this strategy and really want to continue supporting. Um, having a national rare disease strategy, strategy and pathway would allow us to be positioned as a tier one country, which is where we need to be. Thanks, Sandra. And, and I know you folks work very hard. And I will say, you know, Rebecca, you will know as well, you know, our Canadian companies, it's not that they don't want to come to Canada. And in fact, their livelihood depends on their bringing the drugs to Canada. So everybody in Canada, in the Canadian companies are pitching Canada. And what I hear sometimes is, can you just help us out a little bit so that we can make a better pitch to our global environment? Well, okay, but we're going to switch over very differently in terms of perspectives, Nicola. Um, maybe we'll, you, know, you can introduce yourself, where you're coming from, and kind of what does it mean for you that we don't have an orphan drug rare disease strategy? And what do we need to see here? And why is it important? Thank you, Durhan and Cord, for inviting me to participate in this panel today and, and bringing the patient perspective uh, to the discussion. Um, I'd like to share my story uh, with everyone uh, and also to uh, a real life example of the consequences of not having a rare disease strategy. Um, so I have a 13 year old son with Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Um, I also hold a position as director of research and advocacy for a Canadian uh, charity called Jesse's Journey. Um, and it is um, the only charity that's dedicated to only funding uh, research for Duchenne muscular dystrophy. We grant over a million dollars a year uh, in research globally. Um, and so for those of you who aren't familiar with Duchenne, um, it is a rare progressive muscle wasting condition. Um, and my son was diagnosed with at the age of six, which is actually considered late. Uh, typically children with this diagnose are diagnosed between the ages of three to six. And children like my son with this disorder, they weaken as they age. Um, they require a wheelchair by the age of 13, um, and they eventually lose the, their battle to this devastating condition by their late 20s due to either lung or heart failure. And currently there are no treatments that are approved for Duchenne patients in Canada, and care is very much focused on disease management. Uh, but there are, however, five treatments that have been approved in either the USA or in Europe. And the first of these treatments was approved back in 2014 by the EMA. And by 2016, there were families in the UK that were able to access this medication through a managed access program. And six years later today, here in Canada, there are still families that are still waiting for, for this, uh, this therapy. And, and some of these um, families are lucky enough that they might be able to enroll in a clinical trial or they might be able to access these medications through Health Canada's special access program. Um, but most of these cases um, require a hefty out-of-pocket payment through the special access program. Um, so all of these challenges, as you can imagine, lead to increased morbidity, loss of life and poor quality of life, not to mention the costs to our families, to the healthcare system, and to ultimately the Canadian economy. And it's very frustrating for, you know, not just our Canadian families, but our donors and our charities like Jesse's Journey as well, that dedicate and invest so, much, so many dollars into interna international research, uh, only left to really watch our Canadian families and Duchenne families uh, watch their children deteriorate. Um, but this is really a time for hope for our Duchenne community. Today, we have 35 different molecules or biologics that are under investigation globally, and this is all the way from preclinical to clinical. We have 38 active industry-sponsored clinical trials ranging from phase one to phase three that are happening globally today. Um, and um, this covers 16 different industry sponsors. And only a handful of these are, are available for Canadians and, and in Canada today. So this is really um, a great time to make a difference to help the lives of Duchenne families, but many rare disease families. But in order for this to be successful, it really is going to take collaboration and coordination amongst our governments, our patients, our healthcare workers, researchers, 
and our, our industry partners. And um, I mean, we have a number, a number of recommendations and areas of focus of where rare disease strategy can really make a difference. And, and I think really the key points are leveraging, you know, what we see in other jurisdictions and those first to market um, jurisdictions like the EMA, um, um, sorry, like the Europe and the US. Um, but I think too, the, the one point I really would like to make, because I'm in interest of time, is um, the, the, the formalization of a role for the patient and the patient organizations um, to really provide their input to all aspects of the drug process, whether it's drug discovery, clinical trial development, drug approval and reimbursement. Um, and we really um, you know, need our, our government to provide support and resourcing uh, to Canadian patients and patient organizations um, so really help them um, to make a meaningful contribution to all aspects of this process. Thanks a whole lot, Nicola. And that certainly brings it home and brings it to life, as you say. And certainly in the life of a Duchenne um, child, six years is a lifetime. Uh, and it definitely makes all the difference in the world. Naya, okay, I'm going to punt it over to you um, and maybe just introduce yourself and, and give us a sort of a, a, take us back into a global perspective. Where are we now? Where do we need to go? Hi, my name is Naya Wada. I'm a PhD candidate at the Carleton University. I also work as a research professional at the Ottawa Hospital Research Institute. Um, so, discussion on whether to implement a uh, pan-Canadian orphan drug framework have been ongoing for like more than 25 years now and we didn't uh, achieve anything yet, but this delay can be seen in a positive way, which is like Canada is uniquely positioned to develop an evidence-based national strategy for rare disease, including orphan drug. Um, uh, access for orphan drugs. Um, this strategy can learn from other countries experience in managing rare diseases and orphan drugs. Um, when considering the experience of other countries like OECD country with universal healthcare system and comparable health, uh, universal system like uh, Canada, it's very important to acknowledge the differences in healthcare system as well, because those differences may limit the applicability for uh, foreign policy and strategy to the Canadian context. Um, so here comes uh, the importance of considering a national study or national survey plaf uh, platform, which is similar to the one that has been implemented by Your Order Scare um, in early two, uh, 2000s, and it surveyed like 20, 12,000 uh, patients and family with rare diseases, uh, trying to explore their experience with the healthcare service, um, uh, social services, and access to orphan drug, um, and all the aspects of patients uh, with rare diseases. Um, such a platform is very important because it allows a series of surveys uh, to be conducted in a scientific methodology and um, provides a solid quantitative data which helps the development and improvement of public health uh, policies. Also, it's very important because it doesn't only help to evaluate the program, it also helps you to compare before and after. Uh, so, and this is exactly what UK has done. Uh, like UK established a, uh, what they call UK strategy for rare diseases in 2013. They also have done a national survey before and after the implementation to compare if there is improvement before and after. They didn't find a big um, uh, difference before and after implementation of the UK strategy for um, in five years, and that's why they implement other changes. So here comes the importance of having national strategy, uh, national uh, sorry, survey platform in Canada. Um, one thing we can learn from also the UK strategy for rare disease, um, which was developed for all four UK countries to ensure the health uh, care services and the social services that they are providing for patients with their disease are meeting their needs. Um, so this UK strategy like cover all stages of the um, uh, patient um, uh, journey with the rare disease, starting from the prevention of the disease, diagnosis, access to orphan drugs and access to healthcare services, uh, research and coordination of care, um, and equitable and sustainable access to uh, uh, drugs. So one of the things that I would like to mention and bring to um, uh, your attention, it's uh, one finding I uh, got from my uh, study that I've been doing in the last two years. Um, I had uh, the chance to meet with 30 uh, Canadian patients uh, and their family with lysosomal storage disease, a rare uh, genetic disorder. Um, so um, all patients um, from all provinces uh, same, um, uh, face similar uh, challenges in terms of access to orphan drugs and also have care services in terms of referral, uh, you know, uh, uh, access uh, to um, 
uh, different um, healthcare services and diagnosis, um, uh, Odyssey, etc. But one thing that I wasn't initially intending to uh, uh, to tackle because it wasn't like maybe more uh, famous like access to orphan drugs uh, or um, you know uh, too many uh, published uh, uh, literature about it is the access to uh, social support services. Uh, I found that a patient and family, especially the caregiver, uh, they found significant uh, difficulty in accessing, accessing uh, social support services. And this is very important and because, uh, for them because it impacts uh, their quality of life in all aspects. And when we talk about access to social services, that includes the emotional support, like psychological support, because they like suffer from lots of uh, mal uh, challenges all over their journey with the disease, financial support, which includes the supported employment, um, they lose their job or they cannot do it because of the disease or because they need to go with their kids uh, to attend the appointment. As you know, most of the rare diseases are multisystemic, so there are lots of costs associated with the managing of rare diseases. Um, uh, the other financial support services include disability program, which are very difficult uh, for patients to access, either because they don't have the diagnosis, and even when they have the diagnosis, the criteria are very stringent, and most of the time it takes them years uh, to access them. And if they access them, they access a very limited one, and they have to be low income. Um, unfortunately, um, uh, managing the rare disease is very, uh, there are lots of hidden costs uh, with managing rare disease and this is not considered in the computation when looking at if the patient is eligible to access the social services. So this is also something very important to, um, uh, to approach. Um, so access to orphan drug is very important, of course, and there are lots of lessons that we can learn from other countries. But when we talk about um, rare diseases, it's very important to talk about strategy for the whole thing, not only um, you know, uh, targeting uh, one aspect, which is access to orphan drugs. This is important, but equally important is also access to so social support services and supporting family and caregiver for uh, um, you know, um, in a holistic approach to care. And um, social needs needs to be included, uh, uh, needs to be uh, embedded and included in the health um, uh, healthcare plan for patients with rare diseases and their family as well. Thank you very very much, Naya. Um, it looks like we're going to be just right at the top of the hour, so I'm not going to have a chance to actually have a robust discussion around that. I think what we're hearing very strongly, though, from Rebecca and Sandra you know, through to Nicola and Naya is that we're talking about a very comprehensive strategy though. It's a rare disease strategy. It really does have to take into consideration all aspects, but even when we're talking about a drug strategy, we're talking about a whole lot more than just that tiny little piece of, can we get the drugs to patients, which obviously is important, but it isn't, you know, it isn't the only thing. And definitely infrastructure, definitely being able to engage uh, stakeholders. I love the fact around the um, social supports, the social services, it is something that we may not even get a drug for everybody, but we can certainly do a whole lot more to all the other aspects of what a rare disease strategy would do. I love the idea also of having a panel. I mean, Europe has what they call rare barometer. It is a panel of patients who have signed on, tens of thousands of patients who actually serve as their barometer. And it's something that we could do here. And so I will think about it. We probably need a good academic partner to do this with Naya. Um, but so that's just a bit of a note. Maybe we only have no time left almost, but I'm going to just circle right around and just go back and to say, if you would like to, just in 30 seconds, tell us, tell me kind of where you are now after having heard hearing everybody else. Where do we go next? Rebecca, I'm going to start with you. No. Okay. Um, I think we've started, um, initiated a dialogue, which is, I think we've done a bit of a reset, I think, with the throne speech. Um, I love how you're having a series coming up as well. I think the next step is start to engage uh, government. I think that's very important federally and provincially and, and do it in a concerted manner. Um, but I do think we need to come up with what that plan looks like and propose a solution, because that's going to be the question they're going to ask. Perfect, thank you. The engagement of government is a huge important component and we definitely need all the help we can to make sure, because we, we can propose whatever we want, but if there's mm -hmm. no buy-in, policymakers. Sandra. I think the plan you have over the next six weeks to talk to various stakeholders is an amazing plan uh, to hear all voices. Um, I think it's important to summarize and to Naya's point, it's not just about the actual price or reimbursement or regulatory, we have to look at everything. 
I think it will be important over the next six weeks once we hear from all stakeholders, to Rebecca's point, write it down and literally come to it with a package on January 2022 with the whole plan laid out on everything the government has to do to ensure patients are supported and that companies come to Canada and invest. I think we have to spell it out that specifically and getting multi-stakeholder support to make it happen. Thanks a lot. And, you know, it isn't as if, you know, it's either one or the other in terms of these components. They all work together, right? And when we have all the components of it, that's what makes it work. Nicola, back to you. And I will just say, you know, one of the things I'm working on globally is that we have a proposal for looking at carers and caregivers and what the impact is on carers and how do we actually support them with the recognition, even when we're talking about drugs. If you don't have the right support system, these drugs are not going to be meaningfully used. But your uh, final comments in this. I, I agree with everyone's comments here. I think um, having some framework is going to be important to which would, would guide all of the um, uh, aspects of this. But I think what's more important is we need to come to the table now with solutions. And I, I do think it has to be very specific, very solution orientated uh, in, in, in very directed at to what we are asking for and what we expect the outcome to be. And as always, um, you know, it's a collaboration and a coordination between all stakeholders and the patient voice as well as everybody else's voice has to be sitting at that table uh, to come together to bring those solutions to our government. Thank you very much. I'm going to end it on there and I think we've all recognized, you know, it is, we are starting as the patient community to drive this, but we're obviously going to do nothing by ourselves. We need all the stakeholders involved. We definitely need the policymakers and how to bring them to the table in a way that we're all contributing to it. So that's important. Though on the other hand, people say, why are you guys doing this? I say, well, if the patients don't start it, when they start the consultations, they don't, they forget to invite us. So unless we put ourselves out there centrally, we don't even get the invite, but I appreciate it very much. This has been an, a, a fascinating discussion. I'm hoping that we can bring you guys back. We will have, as um, we indicated, four more webinars uh, in this series, and then we will have a national conference. Uh, we're not exactly sure what the form of that will look like, but we'd be delighted to have this panel back at that time. And I'd love to have your thoughts on after five uh, other sessions, you know, where are we and how do we go forward? So we will hopefully be able to do that with some great interactions. Really want to thank all the people who joined us. This has been terrific. We know that, as we said, it is the beginning of a holiday weekend, so people taking the time to participate with us lets us know that this is hugely important to all of you. And do stay tuned for our next um, uh, series. And um, if you have ideas, if you have suggestions, if you have particular examples you want to bring forth, we would really love to hear from you. You can get us at info at rarejisorders.ca. But definitely let us know kind of what you're thinking as well. My huge thanks again to Rebecca, to Sandra, to Nicola, and to Naya for your wonderful contribution. Thanks to everybody. We'll see you in two weeks' time on the same channel. Thank you, everyone. Bye. And Thank thanks you. to Bill Bye. for being my goose in the background. <laughs> Great job, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank, Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Happy Thanksgiving. Yes, and happy, happy Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. Bye. <laughs>